Hello and welcome to Showcase. Today, friends, Hockney and the Catholic Church. Oh, my eyes! I know! My eyes! <laughs> the wait is finally over for I fans of Friends. Then, a new David Hockney exhibit brings the lush French spring to London. And a street artist says the Vatican did her wrong. The much-awaited Friends reunion special has finally arrived and fans can't gush enough about it on social media. One of them called it the best episode ever, while another fan said she can't stop crying. Well, Rachel, Monica, Phoebe, Joey, Chandler and Ross were on a break for 17 very long years. And now the special marks the first time the main cast has reunited. The two-hour special is packed with nostalgia. It features visits to the show's sets, reenactments of older Friends episodes and behind-the-scenes footage. Let's talk to Ananya Bhattacharya, the associate editor of India Today. Hi there, good to have you with us today. So, what did you think, Ananya, Hi. when you heard of the uh, Friends reunion special uh, was coming? Have you been waiting for this? Look, all of us have been waiting 17 years for this, okay? Uh, some of us who haven't had the privilege to watch Friends from 1994 to 2004, you know, because in India there are uh, issues with broadcast and all of that, rights and stuff. So a lot of us watched it, uh, you know, later in our lives and we binged on these episodes in some of the very dark times of our lives, okay? Like I, for one, uh, like Friends saved me in a way, okay? So, yeah, I've been waiting for uh, this reunion for many years now. And when we heard that, yeah, there was going to be a reunion and all, you know, like Joey, Monica, Chandler, uh, Ra Rachel, Ross and Phoebe were coming together one more time. It was just like, you know, it was just too much to handle. It was like we were ecstatic, so to say. Okay, so, uh, well, before we uh, talk about, you know, what you thought about the episode, would you consider yourself a Friends fan? Look, I would consider myself a Friends fan in the sense that I cannot quote verbatim, uh, you know, the sentences, the dialogues from Friends, but I can sort of place what is where uh, because I've watched the series all 10 seasons about what three times. And it's like a show that you come home to. It's a show that you put on any time and you immediately know the context, you know which episode what is. So yeah, I, I think I am a fan fan, but uh, not like a crazy fan, so to say. Okay, so you said that you've been waiting for this episode. So uh, overall, do you think Friends, the reunion, is justifying is it, its existence? Uh, yeah, it was and it was not. Like I was also a little heartbroken because uh, you you don't want your heroes to age. I mean, it might seem like a bad statement, like a wrong statement, a politically incorrect statement. But, you know, we have this thing about our idols that we want them to be sort of like the picture of Dorian Gray. You want them to be uh, there frozen in a certain time frame. And you go back to them and you see them in that they're not young anymore. So 17 years have passed. Some of them have aged gracefully. Uh, the, the invasive treatments are visible on some of their faces. So, yeah, it, it was a little jarring if you think of it that way. But, uh, yeah, overall, I think it was a fitting uh, reunion, but it was like a reunion. You know, you have moved on in life. These yeah. are not your friends anymore. But don't They're you the think actors. That, sorry They're to the cut you off members. there, but it's an interesting point. Don't you think that it's actually, um, you know, kind of fitting because Friends is a show about a time that you know will end even as you live through it, you know, that kind of nostalgic feeling even in the moment. So, you know, what did you think in that sense? Yeah, I mean, see, nostalgia is cruel, okay? <laughs> and uh, time, time is not kind to people. Time is not kind to any of us, actually. I mean, no matter what we think, that we've aged gracefully or we have been through a lot and we have grown in our lives. And yeah, it, it was a fitting finale. Also the point about Friends, the show was that it was a very perfect show, you know. It was, everyone got a good ending. It was perfectly rounded off. 
So if you go back to the reunion episode, that is what all the cast members also seem to think about it, that no one wants to do a fictionalized version of like, no one wants to do another episode of Friends, you know, you won't have a season 11, so to say. So uh, that's because the directors did such a good job with Friends. It was, it was the perfect show. And it was about a certain time, yeah, as you correctly said. Okay, so uh, do you think there was enough ground covered? Because obviously this was all, you know, uh, a nostalgia fest, so to say. But then do you feel like, you know, they could have done so much more in terms of covering, you know, new territories? Yeah, yeah, true. I mean, there's also, uh, there has been a lot of talk of representation and how friends cater to a niche audience because it was a group of white people in New York and their lives. In a way that made it relatable because they fought, they made up, they were selfish, they were not perfect people. They were like you and me, they were like our friends. That's why the appeal, that's why the timeless appeal of the series. But then there were also some problematic parts which they did not address. I mean, one for uh, like for one, the Monica's entire, the appearance, the superficial bits, the weight issue okay that you have to lose weight to become appealing that you have to lose weight to get a boyfriend i think that track has been called out in the years that have passed in between and we didn't see any of that being addressed in the friends reunion i think a lot of fans were waiting for that uh, but we did not get any of that mm -hmm. okay well thank you so much for this i appreciate your time thank you Elif. thank you so much David Hockney saw COVID-19 lockdowns as an opportunity to create without distraction. So he captured the arrival of spring in rural France and brought it to London. When the whole of France went into lockdown last year, David Hockney decided to uproot himself and seek artistic refuge in a little pocket of Normandy. Of that move, he told the Guardian newspaper that everyone should try and escape their circumstances, even if it only meant picking up a pencil and drawing. Well, the 83-year-old took his own advice using his new surroundings as muse. Hockney went on to paint 116 images of spring. But keep in mind, Hockney's definition of painting includes using more tech-savvy brushes, including an iPad, a stylist, and a personalized app. The images he created on screen were later printed onto paper and became the subject of a major exhibit now showing at London's Royal Academy of Arts. Coming out of lockdown, you know, spring always symbolizes new life, you know, nature coming back to life, uh, opening up as it were, so in that sense, and, and David's pictures are also so, you know, optimistic and colorful and really, you know, um, just exude that positive spirit uh, that we all want to feel now. In The Arrival of Spring, Normandy 2020, Hockney pays homage to French Impressionist Claude Monet with his interpretations of water lilies, raindrops, and multitudes of blossoms. Assisting Hockney was a team of mathematicians who created a customized app just for him, which included six personalized brushes and features that allowed Hockney to work and edit faster using his iPad. What he loves about the, the iPad is the convenience, because he makes the point that, you know, I'm not, um, I, I'm not kind of, you know, having to carry around all of this paraphernalia, the, the, the oil paints, the, the, the easel, the canvas, the palette, um, I'm not changing brushes all the time and having things steeped in, in terps. He's able to just pick up the iPad and capture the scene immediately and I think what you get with this is that freshness, that immediacy of that vision that he's able to see. And that vision includes a message of hope. During last year's lockdown, Hockney famously told Instagram followers not to despair. Instead he quipped, do remember, they can't cancel the spring.
The National Gallery of Art is featuring two of Poland's most famous historical figures in one exhibit. Most will know the subject of the artwork and many will not know the painter. Until now, here's Nursen Atutas. A master depicted by another master. This painting is called the Astronomer Copernicus. Jan Mateko painted the dramatic scene in 1873. He's known for depicting important historical milestones in Polish history. But despite being a national treasure, he's not such a well-known historical figure in the UK. So, the National Gallery hopes to change this. So the National Gallery shows um, Western European art from medieval times to the beginning of the 20th century. But we focus on Western art, so it's um, France, Italy, Spain, Britain. Um, there's much more to European art than that. And of course Poland has a great artistic tradition of its own. And Mateko is the leading Polish painter, so what a good place to start, Jan Mateko, and his most famous picture. In this imaginary scene, Nicolas Copernicus turns to God after discovering that the Earth is not the centre of the universe. Mateko made the piece to commemorate the 400th anniversary of the mathematician's birth. And in turn, the National Gallery is holding this exhibit to honour Mateko's art which is also a first for the museum. He's known in Austria and uh, in, in countries around Poland. Um, he was famous also in Paris, where he exhibited during his own lifetime. So it's a fame that's been eclipsed uh, subsequently. Um, the fact that there are no works by him in this country mean that, means that he's not well known here, he's not known at all. And uh, I hope that, as a result of this show, it's a name that people will, will reckon with. He paints these great episodes of Polish history and he's completely kind of bound up with this sense of uh, Polish nationhood at a time when the Polish state didn't exist. It was divided up between uh, neighbouring countries and it was only some decades later that Poland became uh, the country that we know today. A picture that Brits will now be able to enjoy for a little while as the Earth rotates around the Sun and brings us to the end of August. Many street artists have sued big corporations for stealing their work over the years. But now one of them is going against the Vatican. Alessia Babro is a street artist. She stylized this image of Christ in 2019 and glued it onto a wall near the Vatican. A year later, she was shocked to learn that the Holy See printed the artwork on a stamp without her permission. Last month, Babro sued the Vatican's telecommunications office. She wants it to pay her $160,000 in damages. Babro says the Vatican didn't officially respond to her attempts to negotiate a settlement. I couldn't believe it. I honestly thought it was a joke. Then I thought they were acting in good faith, that it was true they were looking for me, like it had been written in the papers. Only it seems it wasn't that way because they never wanted to meet with me. Babro's piece is part of a project she kicked off in 2013. She's made similar stylings on the Buddha and the Virgin Mary. But where's she getting these images from? Well, the Christ picture is actually a famous work by the 19th century painter Heinrich Hoffmann and the Vatican did credit him on the stamp. But the case is still somewhat surprising, because the Vatican has also tried to protect its own copyright in the past, from the Pope's words to its vast art collections. Street artists have done the same too. Some of them have sued big brands including General Motors, Walmart and Oakley. But Babro thinks her case is unique. 
Lo shock è vero. The real shock was that you don't expect certain things from certain organizations. If I had been, I don't know, a random brand of clothes or anything else, indeed that would have been different. So it really appended my personal, professional and ideological life, my view of the world and so on. If Babro needs a pep talk, she can look to her fellow street artist Rhyme. He settled a lawsuit with Moschino in 2016. The brand put one of his murals on a dress without his consent, and it was later famously worn by Katy Perry at the Met Gala. But Babro probably shouldn't read any headlines regarding Banksy's case. The artist first won a suit against an Italian museum which sold Banksy greeting cards. But last week, the EU Intellectual Property Office ruled Banksy's trademark is invalid. The office cited Banksy's own statement that copyright is for losers. So it's hard to tell if Babro will win a suit against one of the world's biggest religious orders. Let's say that at the moment in which the subject who wants to use the artwork demonstrates they've done everything possible and taken every reasonable path to find the artist and did not succeed. Perhaps a judge then would have clemency on the question of the damages, because there would be good intentions. If instead people used the image and didn't make any effort to get in contact with the author, then they did so at their own risk and peril. So the Vatican could have reached Babro, but Babro couldn't have contacted Hoffman. If he was alive though, he could have sued both parties if they did him wrong. And there's no guarantee the current owner of his drawing won't come out and do the same. From a children's book to film, stage and game adaptations, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland is as popular as ever, and now her peculiar world has come to life. Welcome to Alice's Wonderland, created by the Victoria and Albert Museum. Some of her most important adventures are on display here, in an exhibition called Alice, Curiouser and Curiouser. I mean, it's a, a great subject to explore and we wanted to give visitors that idea of being Alice and feeling like you're on a curious journey. So the experience itself, you feel like you're in the books and you're in those moments, whether it's going down the rabbit hole or in the pool of tears or joining the Hatter at a tea party. And along the way, visitors get a chance to check out more than 300 objects charting Alice's influence in the world. Since the book's release in 1865, it has inspired filmmakers, You're back. Alice. Alice. The Alice. artists, and even fashion designers. It's amazing because there is an Alice look. So in the very early Tenniel illustrations, you see Alice and she's quite everyday, but she has things that we recognize, her, her dress, her pinafore, her, her band and comes in looking glass, the Alice band, the ribbon, her hair tied back, her striping, stripy stockings. But since then, she's become all sorts of different Alices. So there's the Dior Disney Alice and then the Catwalk Alice has been extraordinary. So you kind of, in here we can show you the sort of Victor and Rolf interpretations, which were part of an Annie Leibovitz the museum has also set up a virtual reality spot that can make Wonderland feel more like reality. But why have so many people wanted to visit Alice's world in the first place? She's a character that we identify with. We identify with this young girl, young child on a journey, growing up, sort of imagining wonderlands, encountering nonsensical universes, you know, taking all these kind of extraordinary adventures with meeting extraordinary characters. And for now, they're adventures we can experience firsthand and see just how deep the rabbit hole really goes. A 1927 painting by Russian artist Vasily Kandinsky is up for auction after it had been missing for 70 years, according to a Munich auctioneer. 
The story is that it came from a collection and no one knew that it was part of the collection. It came to us and no one had any background on it. We knew it was in the catalog of works, but only as a small drawing. We knew that it existed, but nobody had seen it for the last 70 years. For the past few years, James Kirvin has been photographing abandoned buildings in Lebanon, but his project took on a dire new meaning when last August's port explosions destroyed the capital. So we're now in the Basta uh, district of Beirut, and it's uh, an amazing old house that we're in. One of the most ruined houses I think I've ever photographed, and my first ever location actually here in Lebanon to shoot. British photographer James Kirvin believes the world needs to see Lebanon's abandoned buildings. He's published photographs from 50 locations. They include the ruins of theaters, mansions, palaces, and these old houses. When I see these houses in this sort of disrepair, I would personally love a project where I could pick one up, purchase it, and have the money to be able to convert it into something what it once was, a beautiful place. The buildings in this neighborhood are known for their unique mix of Ottoman and French architectural styles. And Kervin says many of them have gotten public attention in the aftermath of last year's port explosions. I think that's a really positive thing. I think it's a step going forward that might help Lebanon because people suddenly really don't want to lose you know, their houses for skyscrapers and they don't want to have developed, you know, get things d demolished and, and rebuilt. And in terms of like gaining access, that means that people have been a bit more welcoming actually than two years ago when I came. Since the blasts, UNESCO launched the Four Beirut initiative to restore thousands of damaged buildings. But most of the places Kervin has photographed aren't covered. I just think that they're often overlooked as projects, maybe because it's just too much of a financial impact. Uh, and that's probably why um, so many people can't do this. But it would be great if some more of them were in this kind of condition, uh, or even turned into some sort of, some of the best ones, if they were turned into some sort of open house where they're preserved to a point where they're not dangerous anymore and, and people can view them uh, or see them, and maybe museums, this kind of thing. Kerwin is taking action himself. He's raising money for the Beirut Heritage Initiative by giving exclusive content to donors. And he plans to publish a photo book. But he'll have to sell quite a few. Lebanon's buildings have been crumbling after decades of war and economic freefall. And that was well before the port explosions cost an estimated $5 billion in damage. French contemporary artist JR has unveiled his latest art installation, which plays with the eye and gives an impression of cliffs below the Eiffel Tower. Also, I think it's come on a perfect day because with the reopening of outdoor dining, we have the impression that Paris is suddenly coming back to life. I think it's nice for someone to take this type of initiative with the Eiffel Tower, which is a symbol of the city. I think it's really cool because it's really realistic and I like that it like um, 
that it combines with the Eiffel Tower. So it, it the piece of art um, becomes a piece of art because of the Eiffel Tower already behind it. I like it. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Our YouTube channel, Instagram and Twitter account have more from the world of culture and the arts. I'm Elif Bereketli. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. <laughs>